Being an emperor comes with many perks, not least of which is ruling over your people with no questions asked. Unfortunately for him, this wasn't really the case for Pudi, the last emperor of China. His turbulent rule was not just limited to being hard for him, it also made life difficult for Lai Yukin, his last surviving concubine. Lai would go on to outlive everyone in that court and would eventually be the last imperial concubine of China. Welcome to Crazy Histories, where we bring you the craziest and weirdest facts from human history. Some of the things discussed in this video may be offensive or disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Lai Yukin's Early Life Lai Yukin was born into a middle-class Chinese family on July 15, 1928 in Changchun. Changchun is in the northwest of China, sort of near North Korea. Growing up, Lai's family wasn't well off but wasn't poor either. They were commoners but had money to get by. Her father was a translator and her mother owned a small soap farm, and she had two brothers and three sisters. Both sides of her family had connections to the Qing dynasty, which ended 16 years before her birth. One of her paternal great-grandmothers was a wet nurse to the royal family, and her mother's side were court physicians. If her family had these royal connections, how did they end up living in the country? Well, after the Qing dynasty collapsed, many people that were associated with the imperial court were banished to the countryside. Their excess was taken and given to the state, and this move is how they went from high society to being commoners. As a girl, Lai went to Nanling Girls Academy in her hometown of Changchun. At the time, though, Changchun was renamed H. Sinking by the ruling Japanese. It was the capital of Manchukuo and was where the puppet government was run by the Japanese, becoming the imperial concubine. In February of 1943, when Lai was 14, she and nine other girls were taken by their principal to Fujii. There they went to a photography studio to have their portraits taken. Later in life, she said that she remembered the other girls as being the prettiest in her school. Three weeks after that trip, Lai's principal and teacher visited her at home and told her that Manchukuo's emperor ordered that she go to the palace to study. So she packed her school supplies and went with the men. Of course, they did not want her at the palace to continue her education. Rather, they brought her to the palace as a possible new wife for the emperor. At the palace, she was taken directly to Yasunori Yashioka, one of the Japanese military men actually running Manchukuo. He gave her an extensive interview, then took her back home and informed her parents that she would be moving to the palace, still under the guise of going there to study. Her parents did not want her to go, but they were given no choice and were simply told that it was the command of the emperor that she move. Lai's parents were given some money in exchange for her, virtually selling her into slavery. Back at the palace, she finally met Pudi who was more than 20 years older than her. She said that he was very kind and looked younger than his real age of 37. Lai remembered that he offered her dinner, which she declined and he touched her head. When he did this, he thought she might have a fever and called for a physician to come see her. She then underwent an extensive medical examination and it was determined that she should just eat and get some rest. Why doesn't she sleep in the room with Pui? This greatly confused her, because she still thought she was there to study and asked how she could be expected to share a bed with a fellow student or her teacher. Thankfully, Pui didn't push her on this. He simply ate with her in her room and then left. For the next little while, he would make comments to her that confused her. He would tell her that she was lucky to be able to serve the emperor. This made her even more unsure of what her role at the palace was supposed to be. She still thought she was there to study, so was she supposed to be a servant too? Later, he talked about marriage with her, and that only confused her more. Soon after this, Lai was taken to Puyi's sister who taught her about palace protocol. Lai was made Puyi's concubine and was given the title of noble lady Fu. She had many servants and lived an expensive life. She claims that the two of them only had sacks once, but that was not for many years to come. She did say, however, that they did have a physical relationship of some sorts. They would sleep in the same bed, and she would allow him to touch her. That is as much as she ever said of the matter, but you can guess what that means. The fall of Manchukuo. This easy living could not last forever, though. Since the government that Puyi ran was propped up by Japan, it fell at the end of World War II. Lai, Puyi, and other members of the court tried to escape capture and fled by train from Changchun to Dalazigu. Once they got there, though, Pui flew to Mukden with just a few close members of his family, his physician, and a servant. He abandoned Lai and another of his wives. The women were terrified by being left in Dalazigu, 
and they begged to be able to go with him. He refused though, and gave them instructions to get to Japan. It ended up being a good thing that she and the other women did not go with him to Mukden. As soon as he landed, he was arrested and taken to the Soviet Union for the next several years. Lai's luck was not much better, as she and the others that were left in Dalazigu were also soon arrested. However, they were sent to a prison back in her hometown of Changchun. Empress Wan Rong Pui's main wife went through terrible opium withdrawals while in captivity and died later that year. Lai was released the following year and spent several years in a state of half-starvation with members of Pui's family. Eventually, Lai returned home to her family but struggled to find work and was faced with criticism for still being married to the deposed emperor. She also criticized herself in a way. She wanted to start a family of her own, but could not while still being married to Pudi. Finally, with help from the state, she was able to get work at a library. During this time, she began to study works written by Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin. After a few years, Pudi was moved from the Soviet Union and back to China where he got a little bit more freedom than he did before. In 1955, nearly a decade after his capture, Lai began to visit Pudi in prison. He was still her husband after all. After several visits with him, she asked the Chinese authorities for permission for a divorce. They denied this request. Actually, instead of divorce, they took her to a room with Pui in a double bed and ordered that the couple reconcile. This was to try to rehabilitate Pui and bring him around to the new rising power of the communists. Lai says that in order to help themselves, the two did sleep together. This was the one and only time that Lai says the two ever had sex. This attempt to bring Pui to the side of the communists did not work, and Lai was allowed to divorce him several years later in 1958. That same year, she married a technician named Huang Yujang. Calm her life again. Even after her divorce was finalized and she was no longer attached to Pui at all, she was still a political target because of that previous attachment. This was especially true during the Cultural Revolution led by Mao that took place in the late 60s and early 70s. Mao and his Red Guards attacked, both physically and through the media, anyone that had any connections to the previous bourgeoisie regime. It didn't seem to matter that Lai was now a communist or that she was an unwilling participant as Pudi's concubine. She still represented the Qing dynasty. She and Huang managed to get through this period of turmoil and had two sons together. In the 80s, Lai was appointed to an advisory council for the Changchun municipal government, so it seems as though the public was able to look beyond her past associations with Pudi and the Qing dynasty. On April 24, 2001, Lai died in her hometown at the age of 73. She had been battling cirrhosis for six years. Lai Yukin had a wild young adult life, plucked from the common class, thrust into the elite of the elite, and then pushed back down to Connor. Lai really saw every level of wealth in her life. Have you ever heard of her before? Let us know in the comments, and then be sure you give this video a like and the channel a follow.